Good morning. Can you hear me? Is it too loud? Okay. Lee, can you hear me out there? Wonderful. Okay. Well, welcome this morning. We're so glad you're here. Nice group of people. I have no idea how many, but we got lots of people here today. Almost 50. About 50 people. That's great. So aren't you glad you're here? I am. The call to worship this morning is from James chapter 4, verse 8. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. That's good news today. Let me just share a couple of announcements with you. Uh, Mary File is having her 95th birthday on Tuesday. If you haven't sent her a card, please do if you can. And uh, she's over at Hits Home. You can look that up on the phone book if you don't know the if you don't know the address. But let's send Mary a lots of cards. When you're 95 and you're in a place where you can't go anywhere, it's nice to have cards. So we're so glad that she's able to be uh, doing okay. So please do that. And even if it gets there late, she won't care. She'll be happy to get it whenever it comes. Um, any other announcements? Uh, Roger and Susan had a 45th anniversary. Roger and Susan had a 45th anniversary. Are they here? No. Well, you pass it on to them, would you? Okay. Their son's here, so uh, we're happy to share all these things. Well, at this point, Donna's going to come and lead us in songs. And we have, we have a song sheet. Hopefully everybody has one. And let's plan on seeing. Good morning. I know all of us combed our hair this morning. It still looks great. <laughs> okay, let's all sing Blessed Assurance, verses 1 and 3. back there where we are it's 87.9 okay thank you thank you <laughs> okay mm. greatest i faithfulness and we're doing one two and three all verses Oh, my God. 
Eddie's going to come forward and read the uh, scripture. And I just got a question for the ladies or anybody. Would we like to have CPW this week? You know, there's only five, six of us. So if one want to sit on that side of the church, another one on this, we haven't had a meeting for a while. So let me know afterwards. Okay. Thank you. The scripture reading today is Psalm 1. I'm reading from the New International Version. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither, whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked, they are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. We're all going to sing, I must tell Jesus, the first and last verse. <clears throat> Okay, at this time, we will uh, share a time of prayer. We need to keep praying for our nation with all the things that we're going through right now. Seattle and other areas that are there's trouble. I'm so thankful. I want to give praise to God that, that the event in Greenville was went without any serious problems. It was, it was a, uh, just a peaceful protest, which is fine. And we're so thankful for that. And... Uh, we're thankful for so many things. We want to keep praying for Tess Lohman. She is improving from what I hear. And she's been able to walk with a walker. She's been able to have her ventilator out part of the time. So there are several, several good things in that situation. She's the one who was in the accident and where, uh, where Lincoln was killed and she was there seriously injured, not too far from here. So those are some things we want to remember. Let's just remember, like I said, our nation. Uh, and let's pray. Father, as we come together right now, we are so thankful that we can offer to, in prayer to you our concerns. We're concerned for our nation, the division we sense right now in the nation. We pray for our president. We pray for our members of Congress. We pray for other leaders, our state leaders, our local leaders, for our police departments, and for uh, racial reconciliation, Lord, we just pray that all of these things 
would be the way you would want them to be, Lord. Help us. May people turn their hearts toward you in this time. Father, we just thank you so much that you're here with us. We're thankful for each person who is here. We're thankful that we can share openly our faith and that you hear us when we pray. Lord, bless this time of worship and praise that we might please you in all that we do and say. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. I've been told there are somewhere around 50 or so people here. I believe it. More than 50. More than 50. Maybe 60. Who knows? It's a little hard to get a count. <laughs> but we're so glad you're here. And we haven't... I, let's just don't worry about next week until we know what the weather is. There's a possibility of thunderstorms, which means we'll have to be inside. If it's a nice day, we could be outside. So we'll, we'll just take a day at a time and deal with that later in the week and get word out to you when that time comes. So at this point, I want to read some scripture to you. I'm reading from Genesis chapter 13. The truth is, my past, my sermon is based on chapters 13 to 19, but I don't really think you want me to read all of those chapters this morning. What I'm going to read is a portion from chapter 13, and then I will refer to passages from those other chapters as we work through this uh, sermon this morning. So Abraham went up from Egypt to the Negev with his wife and everything he had, and Lot went with him. Abraham had become very wealthy in livestock and silver and gold. Now I'm going to skip down to verse 6. But the land could not support them while they stayed together, for their possessions were so great that they were not able to stay together. And quarreling arose between Abram's herders and Lot's. And so Abram, about verse 8, said to Lot, Let's not have any quarreling between you and me, or between your herders and mine, for we are close relatives. It is not the whole land before you let spark company. You go to the left, I'll go to the right, or if you go to the right, I'll go to the left. Lot looked around and saw that the whole plain of the Jordan toward Zor was well watered, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose for himself the whole plain of the Jordan and set out toward the east. The two men parted company. Abram lived in the land of Canaan, while Lot lived among the cities of the plain and pitched his tent near Sodom. Now the people of Sodom were wicked and were sinning greatly against the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, as we look into your word this morning, speak to our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. What I'm sharing about this morning is the story of Lot and Lot's choices. Greener pastures are often appealing. You look at your neighbor's house and, oh, wouldn't it be nice if I had a house like that? You look at your neighbor's car and, oh, wouldn't it be nice if I had a car like that? It always looks better. And I heard a story and this could have happened in anybody's neighborhood, probably, where this person was looking at the big house next door and the beautiful cars and the three-car garage and all the things they had. Thought, this family must really have it. Pretty soon, something happened where alcoholism, a car wreck killed the husband and wife, left the children as orphans. That didn't look so pretty, did it? We don't know what the other person's going through when we, we should not covet our neighbor's things. There's nothing wrong with enjoying looking at somebody, a neighbor's house, and say, that's pretty, that's a nice house, and saying, I'm glad you have that. That's okay. Now, there are several things that Lot did, and we're going to look at them because it tells us about what can happen with a downward spiral spiritually. Now, the passage that San Sandra read to us speaks to the same thing. Blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, or standeth in the way of sinners, or sitteth in the seat of mockers. Who walks, then he stands, and then he sits. You see a difference here? When you're walking by, you may look, but you're, you're still walking. When you stand, then you've paused to look longer. When you sit, now you're comfortable. Do you see the difference? And that goes along with Lot's story here because 
He looked up, it says here in verse 10, and saw that the whole plain of the Jordan was well watered like the garden of the Lord. Now, there wasn't any wrong with that. So I'm not condemning Lot for choosing that. It looked good. That's fine. And Abraham didn't have a problem with that. Abraham is such a gentleman here. Oh, I just love the way Abraham handles it. Because his attitude is, Lot, if you, you just choose whichever you want. If you want that, I'll choose this. If you want this, I'll choose that. Isn't that a beautiful attitude? We had a situation in a church I pastored one time that where there was a controversy over whether somebody's name should be on a piano, you know. And there was a man who said, you know, just put her name on it. She didn't give it. We don't care. Now, that's a beautiful attitude. I like that kind of attitude, don't you? It's an attitude of generosity. So here we are. So the first step toward temptation is when we, when we start looking. Now, there's nothing wrong with looking. It's not a sin to look. Well, depending on what you're looking at, it could be a sin, couldn't it? If it's something that's going to destroy you. So, uh, but we can't help but see some things. Some things, it just happens we see them, and, but we don't want to linger on them. I was, uh, I may be tempted to take a job with higher pay or greater prestige, but I need to weigh what I might have to give up to do it. When I left teaching, I had to give up tenure before I went to a church in Michigan to pastor. And that was kind of hard to think about because there was security and tenure as a teacher. Uh, would I be sorry? And I, had to I was going to leave my hometown that I had grown up in. Will I be sorry? And a church superintendent visited my home and he said he could see how I might find it hard to give up my house. He really didn't understand me. The house was not that important. It was a nice, I, I liked my house. But it wasn't going to keep me from doing what God's will. So, was it greener pastures going to a different state, to a church not of my choosing? Probably not. It worked out to be okay. Emerson put it this way. <coughs> Beware of what you want, you will get it. Now, I don't know that Emerson was a Christian, but I, but I do know this. That's good advice. Beware of what you want, you will get it. There's a danger, isn't there, in that? So the first thing was he looked. He said, I like that property over there. So that's where he went. The second one, we're going to look down to verse 13, chapter 13, verse 12. And this verse says, Abraham lived in the land of Canaan while Lot lived among the cities of the plain and pitched his tents near Sodom. Okay. I call this Lot leaned towards Sodom. The first one was Lot looks towards Sodom. The second one was he leaned. He's moving closer. So he's pitched his tent near these cities. Again, that's not necessarily bad, but it, it shows he's getting closer to where the evil is. Because it says here that the cities are very wicked. Now today, I'm not going to discuss what the wickedness was of the cities. I have my personal opinion. I think it's pretty clear that there was a lot of immorality going on, and you can judge for yourself, read the passage, it tells you. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about dealing with any kind of sin. You may say, well, that's not my sin. Okay, what is your sin? What is the one that you're tempted to do? That's what we want to talk about. So he leaned toward Sodom. There's a the look, the choice. Now there's a decision to move near there. I do not know how much Lot knew about the city of Sodom. We will not hold him accountable for this. But as the next verses tell us, it was a very wicked city, as it says, they were sinning greatly against the Lord. And he probably didn't know that when he moved there. I don't know. Sometimes God gives us warnings. I, do, I think he does. and I don't know if he gave him any warnings or not. I've had dreams before to warn me about something. Now, I'm not an expert on dream interpretation, so I don't think I am. And you bring your dream to me for interpretation, I probably won't be able to tell you. But, but I have had some of my own personal ones where I felt like the Lord was speaking to me. Just like he speaks to our thoughts, through our conscience in times. So, so be careful of what you're moving toward. Whether it's a physical move or a move of the mind, let the Lord check you. Pray about your decision before you act. That brings me to the third one. Now, chapter 14, verse 12, it says, he was living in Sodom. Oh, I thought he was just pitching his tent near Sodom. He was. Now, he not only looked and said, that looks good. 
And now he's moved close to town. Now he's moved in town. Now, do you think if he was living close, he might have gotten some idea that maybe there was some bad stuff going on there? I don't know. We can't judge him. But he did make the mistake of moving in. Some other kings had battled with the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah and two other kings and carried off the spoils with Lot and his possessions. Lot looked toward Sodom and thought it looked good. He leaned toward Sodom, moving toward the city, and now he's just moved in town. Was he aware of what was going on? I don't know. We can't judge that. But the closer he got, I would think he would begin to see some problems. So he's gradually moving closer to temptation. That brings me to number four. So he looked, he leaned, he, he uh, lived in. Now, if we, we're going to jump over some chapters here because it talks about other things. And then chapter 19 goes on to talk about it. God is going to destroy Sodom and Gore. He, there's some, uh, he's told Abraham that. And Abraham said, well, if there are just so many people, will you save it? And he keeps reducing the number and finally gets it down to 10. And finally, finally God says, okay, for 10 people, I will not destroy it. But then he says, you better get those people out because I'm going to destroy it. And because it was less than 10. It was only, really, Lot, his wife, and his two daughters. That's only four. And we'll talk more about that. So, verse, um, verse 1 of chapter 19 says, The two angels arrived at Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gateway of the city. Why was he sitting in the gateway of the city? My understanding of the culture of that day is that's where the mayor or the head person was. So, think about that for a moment. He's not only looked, he's not only leaned, He's not only lived in, and now he's becoming one of their leaders. Interesting, isn't it? The progression downward. He was sitting at the gateway of the city, and when he saw them, he got up to meet them and bowed down with his face to the ground. My lords, he said, please turn aside to your servant's house. You can wash uh, your feet and spend the night and then go your, on your way early in the morning. No, the answer will spend the night in the square. Now, I want to ask you a question. Does he know what's going on? Look at his response. But he insisted strongly that they, they go with him and enter his house. He knew that if they stayed in this, down in the town square, there would be trouble. And if you go on, so I said he legislated for Sodom. He's now a leader, perhaps a mayor. If you're a leader, you would know something about the people in that city and what kind of people they were. And as you read further in the story, you see he was aware of the sinful men because he begged angels to stay, away, stay at his house rather than the street because the men of the town, young and old alike, it must have been a whole bunch of them, came and wanted to do evil things with those angels, sexually things. So do you know what's going on? Yes. Is he leg he's legislating for the city. He's one of their key people. Folks, he knew what he was getting into now, I believe. So the man of the city asked to do terrible things. Why did he stay in the city? If I knew I was in a wicked city like that, I wouldn't want to stay, would you? No, I wouldn't want to stay. I'd want to leave the place. Get as far away as possible. But sometimes, why did he say? Maybe because he had earned great wealth in that city. Maybe he liked the prestige. Maybe he liked being mayor. Maybe he liked being in a place of authority. I don't know. But it looks suspicious, doesn't it? Blessed is a man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. The person who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers. That's talking, that's Psalm 1, but that's also talking about Lot, isn't it? So, that brings us to the next thought. So, back down to chapter 19, verse 14. Well, verse 9, get out of our way, they replied, this fellow came here as a foreigner, and now he wants to play the judge. 
We'll treat you worse than them. They kept bringing pressure on Lot and moved forward to break down the door. These are really nice people, aren't they? Oh. But the men inside reached out and pulled Lot back into the house and shut the door. Then they struck the men who were at the door of the house, young and old, with blindness, so they could not find their, the door. The two men said to Lot, Do you have anyone else here, sons-in-laws, sons or daughters, or anyone else in the city who belongs to you? Get them out of here, because we are going to destroy this place. The outcry of the Lord against its people is so great that he has sent us to destroy it. Now, if you go on down, so Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law who were pledged to marry his daughters. He said, hurry and get out of this place because the Lord's about to destroy the city. But his sons-in-law thought he was joking. So my point now is he lost his testimony. He looked, he leaned, he lived in, he legislated for, and now he's lost his testimony. His son-in-laws don't even believe him. When he says, you've got to get out of here, it's a wicked place. They, they weren't married to his daughters yet, but they were engaged. They were betrothed. This tells that his life was such a compromise that those son-in-laws did not believe him. He had lost his testimony. If you continue to compromise with evil, it will eventually show you up for who you are. I, this quote is often attributed to Lincoln, and some say it didn't come from him, but... I don't care, it's a good quote. You can fool all the people some of the time, all the people some of the time, but you cannot fool all the people all the time. And you certainly cannot fool God. Are there compromises in your life that cause you to lose your testimony? Well, that brings us to the final one here, and I don't normally have a six-point sermon, but this number six says, Lot left behind the fruit of his backsliding. What happened when he got out of the town? Okay, so they left the town. You've heard the story. And as they were getting quite a distance from the town, God was raining down uh, fire and brimstone on the city. Now, some believe it was an eruption that came up. It's where the Dead Sea is now, which is a salt sea. But it, it, evidently there was some kind of, maybe it was like a volcanic eruption. I don't know, but it was, God did it. And destroyed the city. And in the process of doing that, the family were out of the city, but Lot's wife's heart, I think, was still in Sodom. Because she looked back and it said she turned into a pillar of salt. Now, I've always felt that be a little strange. And uh, I heard a little boy say, yeah, well, that's nothing. My mom looked around and turned into a telephone pole. Well, I think what happened was you don't just all of a sudden become a pillar of salt. But if there was that salt that was going up into there and coming down, it could have coated her. And does that make some sense now? It could have actually come down and encased her because she was looking back and maybe, maybe starting to move back that direction. We don't know exactly. But anyway, that happened. So here he is a lot. His wife's gone. He has two daughters with him, just three people now. And they go up in the hills to escape. The sad part is the ending of the story where, where they actually the, uh, the daughters decide to have children by their dad. Now they, they knew that was wrong and they got him drunk. But here's the final part of that story is the children that were born, one was called ben Ami and one was called uh, Moab, Moab. And they became the Moabites and the Ammonites who were the, some of the enemies of the people of Israel. Look what happened as a result of that sin. Be sure your sins will find you out. Sometimes our wickedness will leave lasting consequences. God can forgive any sin. I'm sure of that today. I don't care what your sin is. There's no sin too great that God cannot forgive. It. But sometimes when we sin, it leaves a lasting consequence that we... We don't like. There may be people hurt. There's one passage of scripture that says the sins of the fathers are passed on to the second, third, and fourth generation. That hadn't happened here because the sin of Lot and his two daughters ended up affecting future generations, didn't it? Well, my, what's my challenge to you today? 
be careful where you look. Be careful what you lean toward. Be careful where you move toward. Be careful what you get involved in because people don't all of a sudden jump into sin. You hear about some person who all of a sudden you hear an awful thing they did. And you think, well, how could they do that? Because there was a gradual letting go. You don't just all of a sudden jump from being a, a godly person to being a terrible sinful person. There's something letting go along the way where you've compromised. So what we want to do is, the challenge today is, let's check ourselves along the way. Let's say, Lord, check me. Is there a problem? Is there a problem here? And before I get too far into it, Lord, take care of it. You know, Help me to know what I need to do. And if you do that, I think you'll find that that makes a world of difference in your life. We're going to sing in closing the other hymn that's listed on your song sheet. Yield not to temptation. I'm going to, we're going to sing the first and third, but let me read the second one. Shun evil companions, bad language disdain. God's name hold in reverence, nor take it in vain. Be thoughtful and earnest, kind-hearted and true. Look ever to Jesus, he'll carry you through. Let's sing verses 1 and 3 at this time. Yield not to temptation, for yielding is sin. Each victory will help you, some other to win. Fight manfully onward, dark passions subdue. Look ever to Jesus, he will carry you through. Ask the Savior to help you, comfort, strengthen, and keep you. He is willing to aid you. He will carry you through. To him that o'ercometh, God giveth the crown. Through faith we shall conquer, though often cast down. He who is our Savior, our strength will renew. Look ever to Jesus. He will carry you through. Ask the Savior to help you. Comfort, strengthen, and keep you. He is willing to save you. He will carry you through. Let's pray. Father, help us to be obedient and to listen to your voice and to let you speak to our hearts. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace now and evermore. Amen. Have a wonderful day. And you're dismissed.